Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Oklahoma County, in Oklahoma, on this occasion, there had been a big snowstorm and nothing was moving on the street. There weren't even any tire tracks. I was about 15 years old and worked at a fast food restaurant about a mile north of this location and was forced to walk home because my father had called and told me that conditions were so bad he couldn't get the car out of the driveway. The heavy blanket of snow made visibility good, reflecting light as it does. As I cleared some trees to the east, I observed movement to my left through peripheral vision and looked to my left into the ravine and saw a figure apparently playing in the snow. For an instant, I thought that it was a child wearing a dark colored snowsuit, but as the moment passed, I became very aware that this was no child. I had a very clear view of it and could see that it was black or very close to black and covered with long hair or fur from head to toe. It was probably around five feet tall and weighed about 160 pounds. The creature continued playing in the snow, bending over at the waist and throwing snow up into the air with both hands in a wide scooping motion, throwing it up so that it came back down on its head. It also began rolling in the snow. I felt stark terror at the sight of the thing. I was also very unnerved, knowing that I was very far from any residential area in the early morning and that there was absolutely no traffic on the road. The creature was only about 30 to 35 yards from me, and I had about an eighth of a mile to clear until I was out of sight of the creature. I thought about running, but I feared that my footfall and rapid motion would catch the thing's attention and that it would then begin chasing me, as is instinctive for a lot of animals. The point is, I had quite a bit of time to view this thing, and the longer I looked at it, the more I realized what I was looking at did not fit any rational explanation. Once I was out of sight and I thought I was out of earshot, I ran as fast and as far as I could. This area is now a park, Hafer Park, but at the time nothing was there but a wooded area and the ravine, which is a drainage ditch. Even now with the park, there is still a good deal of wooded area there. Locals have dubbed this creature the skunk ape, reportedly because of its terrible odor. I did not smell anything in this incident, but I have a very poor sense of smell and serious sinus and allergy problems, which are routinely exasperated by the cold weather. The sighting was between 1.30 to 2.30 a.m. It was heavy, heavy snowfall, enough to stop any traffic on the roadway. The blanket of snow added visibility by reflection. It was very cold, of course, just off of a four-lane roadway, at the time, no residences or businesses were within about a mile except to the north. The area to the east of the roadway was a creek drainage ditch, becoming a wooded area a short distance from the roadway. To the west, a field and a wooded area beyond, a shopping center to the north, about half a mile. The area where the creature was actually standing was a creek bottom, rarely filled with much water. I have heard accounts of other smaller statured Bigfoot or skunk ape, but the closest sighting I know of were in El Reno. I remember seeing a story about these creatures on a local television nude broadcast a couple of years after this incident, but I can't remember many of the details. On to the next one.
What has reddish brown hair, stands a stocky four to five feet high, and smells like a sewer? That's what some folks around here would like to know. Bill Perry, a 15 year old high school freshman, says he saw such a creature while scouting for coyote tracks along Trail Creek near his home of South Beachy. His family says it prowled on their property and near their house for more than a month this winter. Hair samples were found by Perry's house, was sent to Sasquatch Investigations of Mid-America. Was it from a Bigfoot? The hair sample looked very interesting. At this point, we cannot confirm what kind of animal it came from. Adding a sample was being forwarded to the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation Forensic Lab in hopes of analysis. I feel it's just a matter of time before a Bigfoot is captured alive, says Director of Sasquatch Investigations of Mid-America. Dewey County Sheriff Larry Pike, on the other hand, says he has heard only rumors about the strange animal, but nothing official. Sightings also have been reported in nearby Roger Mills County. Search parties were formed after similar sightings of an unidentified creature were reported in eastern Oklahoma near Brislau and Stillwell. Nothing was found. Vichy is in Dewey County. On to the next one. In Cherokee County in Oklahoma. It was near the Illinois River southeast of Park Hill. I was out with my fraternity camping near the Illinois River. It was around early October. We were in a small clearing near the river under a small hill. There were several of us in the group. Me and two of my friends walked into the tree line under the hill to gather some firewood for the campfire. It was dark and we had only one flashlight. As we gathered wood up on the side of the hill, something started rustling through the trees. The hill was thickly covered in sumac, which would be very difficult to navigate especially in the dark. Whatever was on the hill started approaching us, maybe about a hundred feet away. It was starting to break some of the branches in the sumac and sounded big. We couldn't see anything through the dense brush, but whatever it was, was coming towards us. One of my friends picked up a rock and threw it toward whatever was making the noise. It stopped just momentarily and then began running in our direction. At that, we all got scared and ran back to the campfire where the rest of the members were. None of the rest of our fraternity members heard anything. We thought they may have been trying to prank us, but all said they'd been right there waiting for us to bring back wood. We all decided to end our outing and got in the vehicles and headed back to the campus. This is about the best I can remember what happened. It's been many years now. The only other thing I can remember right now is that there was a musty smell about the time, whatever it was. Whatever it was started walking down the hill. It smelled like dead fish in stagnant water. I'm no expert in sounds, but whatever was rustling was making footfalls that sounded bipedal. We were looking for firewood. We stayed fairly close since we only had one flashlight. We'd walked away about 300 yards from our other fraternity members into the tree line and were out of sight of them. I don't think we could hear them because of the river running. It had just rained quite a bit and the river was full. It was around 10 p.m., clear night, no moon. Very dark, but stars were out. It was calm winds and cool, probably in the 50s. It was a flat area near the river. However, the hill was close by, within about 300 feet. It was probably within about a half to one mile of farms and houses nearby. One of my other fraternity members, he didn't gather wood with us, had told us that when he and his brother were younger, they lived further up the river, about seven miles in the woods. One night when his parents were gone, he and his brother were at home and something started banging on the side of the house. They were too afraid to go look. When their parents got back, they told them what happened and their dad went outside and found some large, 
barefoot human-looking prints around the house. They were going to take pictures the next morning, but it rained and washed the prints away. On to the next one. In Thelma County in California, I was backpacking with my younger brother. He was 16 and I was 21. This is a very remote area. We had a great deal of difficulty getting there via rough logging road. First night, close to the trailhead, we heard lots of animal sounds, which reinforced the remoteness of the area. The next morning, we hiked out of our camp and started heading down to the river. This was not by choice as it was the only trail out of there. I'll admit being distressed that day. We got lost twice, once with attendant panic and ran out of water in about four to five miles in. We were paralleling the Eel River and descending in altitude. My hope was that we would make it to the river, but the trail was wiped out by a slide. Going down the slope to the river was out of the question, as it was far too steep. We hiked a little further to get a better look at the side. Water was getting to be a real concern now. A few hundred yards from the side was a trickle of water crossing the trail. This was the only water we had seen for miles. There was just enough room to get our canteens partly filled. There was mud where the water crossed the trail and there was a giant footprint in the middle of it. It was maybe 18 to 19 inches long and maybe 6 to 7 inches wide. Water was seeping back into the depression, which gave me a thick feeling like this thing had just been there. There was no misinterpretation. We both quickly dismissed it as a bear or human track. The area upslope of the seep was disturbed, but more like a very rough game trail and very steep. It was late in the afternoon at this point. I made the decision that we would have to spend the night in that location. This elicited howls of protest for my 16-year-old brother. We laid in our bags a few yards away and spent a wide-awake night in that location. No unusual sounds were heard during the night. We hightailed it out of there as soon as there was light. On to the next one. It was my first Boy Scout summer camp, and I was 12 years old. We had traveled from Long Beach, California on a Saturday, the day before the other troops were to arrive. Our scout troop was through our church, and we didn't like to travel on Sunday. When we arrived at camp, we discovered that the camp staff had all gone to Big Bear, California to a party, so we were the only scouts in the campground. We went down to our assigned campsite and set up camp. It was approximately 11 p.m. when we first heard the screams. We were all gathered around the outdoor stove, telling jokes and stories when we heard the first scream. It started out like a wolf howl, but ended like a man's scream. It stopped the cricket from chirping. Our scoutmaster came out of his tent to listen as well. Then we heard it again. It sounded like it came from about one mile south of our campground. Needless to say, we were pretty scared. We all went to sleep at about 12 a.m. At about 1 a.m., my buddy Kenny woke me up and told me that there was something moving around in the bushes and trees next to our campground. We all woke up and Kenny got up and walked over to where the rustling was coming from. He then shined his flashlight into the area north of our campground, and there it was. A Sasquatch was standing in the tree line looking at us. We all broke out yelling and screaming. It was about six to seven feet tall and had brown hair all over except the face. It had a very short neck and long arms going down to the knees. Its eyes reflected the flashlight's beam like a rabbit's would. The eyes shone red. It turned and with long steps walked northeast from the area and then up a steep wooded hill and out of sight. One of the guys actually peed his pants from fright. The camp staff told us that they had heard of sightings around the campground area. It was hot summer weather. The incident occurred at 1 a.m. The area is heavily wooded mountain area. There was a trail east of the campground that ran north to south. The Sasquatch crossed this trail then went up the hill. On to the next one. 
my friends and I had been rock climbing at Raven Cliff Falls in the Chattahoochee National Forest outside of Helen, Georgia. After climbing all day Friday and Saturday morning, a rainstorm made us pull down our rigging and head out of the woods. We drove down to Helen and walked around until around 5 p.m. We filled up the truck and headed back up towards Raven Cliff to find a campsite for the night. We found a small dirt road that had been barricaded with a large dirt berm. We drove over the berm and drove into the forest. We drove until we had a half tank of gas, which put us several miles back in. Around 11 or 11.30 p.m., we found a small clearing and decided to stop and make camp. Once we exited our truck, we found a shallow hole that was about three to four feet in diameter that appeared to be an old fire pit. It had a large log lying on one side of it. We gathered wood for a fire and began to set up camp. Since the weather was nice, we decided to not mess with tents and hammocks. After about 30 minutes of lying down, I heard a noise in the tree line on the left side of our camp. It sounded like an animal moving through the brush. I dismissed it and tried to go back to sleep. I continued to hear the noise for several minutes. I have spent a lot of time in the woods, hiking and camping. The next thing I heard was like nothing I had ever heard before. I heard a grunt and then a scream that did not sound like any other animal. It sounded like it came from maybe 50 to 100 yards away. I asked what it was and my friend did not answer. We began kidding, saying we were out a good way and it could be a Sasquatch. I did not go to sleep for a while after the scream. Finally, I drifted asleep and slept until daybreak. As we got up to get our gear packed, we noticed prints next to the fire pit that none of us had ever seen before. They definitely were not human, but were too big for any animal known to be indigenous to that area. We quickly loaded up and left the area. This occurred at around 1 or 1.30 a.m. It was dark. It was 55 to 60 degrees. The sky was extremely clear. There was a lot of pine trees and, in a few places, very dense undergrowth. We drove down what appeared to be an old logging road. On to the next one. I had taken my first trip to the North Georgia Mountains, specifically the Tallulah Gorge area. After hiking to the bottom of the gorge, I hiked to another local area near a lake called Lake Raburn, and I viewed some waterfalls called Minnehaha Falls. The sun was already setting, and when I completed the fairly easy stroll to the falls, I noted that I was the only person at the falls. I did not observe anything weird at the time, but I did catch a whiff of something smelly in the area. Not quite the smell of a dead animal, but the smell of something very musty and almost sweaty. I stayed until it was completely dark, and I fished my flashlight out of my backpack. As I finished my ham sandwich, I began to get up off the ground to hike out. It was at this time I noticed a figure of what I thought was a person squatting to the right of the falls in some bushes. I thought it was another hiker I had either failed to see sitting there or someone who had arrived after me. I did not turn my light on yet, and I did not want to turn it on so as to blind the other person. I began to walk in the direction of the other person to say hello, and that is when it stood up, and I could obviously tell that the thing was about nine to ten feet tall. I still thought it was a very tall person until I got to within 20 feet of it, and the smell became incredibly bad. I could hear the thing breathing shallow 
and it kind of sounded like when a person has a chest cold with some gurgling or rattling in the chest. I stopped and turned my light on and tried to shine it on the thing, but it began to turn away from me as it took very long strides as it walked on two legs. It was dark brown in color and had matted hair covering its body. It stopped and turned toward me from about 60 feet away and took about five to six steps towards me in the bushes. I became scared and drew my service pistol from my fanny sack, I'm a police officer, and stood my ground while yelling at it to stop. It stopped and then turned away. The creature walked away without turning back. I left the area and drove back to my apartment in Marietta, Georgia. I did not tell anyone about this, as I thought they would think I was crazy or lying. It was dusk turning to night with partially cloudy skies and around 60 degrees. The area was hardwood trees and pine trees with rock waterfall with surrounding low cliffs and bushes. On to the next one. Carrie and Ronnie lived in Arkansas in a nice three-bedroom farmhouse on 45 very fertile acres in Malvern, surrounded by heavy woods on two sides, plus a big 75 by 75 foot barn and loft. They swapped out corn and soybeans every few years, and for some reason, they were seriously overrun with wood rats. They were everywhere, worse than ever before. They were just nasty, mean, nearly 18 inches long, including their tails, and eating their way through bushels of corn stored in the barn. Losing money every day, they farmed and they both worked part-time jobs to pad the income. They didn't need to, just did it to retire early. But they got used to the extra funds after a while, and the loss of even a small amount of revenue on a nearly daily basis, well, that's not a good thing. And it was a small amount of money in the scheme of things, but of a more pressing issue was the potential infestation if they didn't nip it in the bud. The rats seemed especially drawn to a burn pile they had on the side of their property, almost even with the house. The home sat about a half acre off the road that was in front of their house, and the burn pile was to the right and was lined up just slightly in front of the front porch. It was about 35 yards or so from the porch, and it was a small pile for some dead and rotting stalks and the normal waste generated by any home or farm. Ron's short-term solution for the rat was to go sit on the porch after dinner before dusk and picked them off with an old twenty two rifle. It had a scope and was sighted in pretty well, though he told me he was a pretty good shot and didn't really need the scope. But it was there, and he said he left it on for his wife Carrie, who was not the good shot he was, at least according to him. And he had a very powerful handheld spotlight, so he could pick them off at night. Easy pickings and Carrie would join him out there every now and then. She held the light, and he shot. It was spring of 2014 when they first noticed something was awry. As was his usual custom, he would go out to the pile after night of shooting critters and varmints and scoot any dead critters into the pile to be set ablaze by the next burn. They burned about once a week, sometimes more, depending on the carcasses and waste. And of course, some of the carcasses were pretty picked over as nature took its course, but they burned whatever was left. Ron went out one morning after a good night of shooting to clean up the burn site. When he got there, he couldn't find the bodies of the rat. Gone. He rummaged around, and then he found a head, and then another, and another. Five heads and no bodies. He knew he had hit at least five the previous night, and he saw them lying where he dropped them. What the heck, he thought? The heads were torn off clean as far as he could tell, definitely not cut. He later said it was a passing thought that they were bitten off, but knowing the local predators and scavengers as he did, that scenario was not an option. They carry the kill 
or eat them on the spot. The rats around there were in the half pound to up to a pound range, and even at half a pound, the night kill would be two to two and a half pound, a good meal for just about anything known around here. He called for Carrie to come out, and he showed her what he found. She looked and immediately asked where the bodies were, and was he pranking her? From the look on his face and overall demeanor, she could tell it wasn't a prank. He was more bewildered than concerned for this brief moment. They looked around for a good 10 to 15 minutes and found no trace of the bodies. They were on a schedule and he had to get going to tend the farm and she had to get to town for a part-time job. They were quite puzzled but decided to chalk it up to some weirdness going on. And they tossed the head into the burn pile for the next burnt offering. When they sat down for dinner that evening, they had both decided that sitting on the porch to see what was doing that was the best idea. It was probably happening after they went to bed, but no harm in trying anyway. They were running a bit behind normal schedule, and they didn't hit the porch until about 9.30 nearly dark Malvern time. Ron popped his feet up on the porch rail, grabbed his rifle, lit a cigarette, and waited. Carrie brought a couple of wine coolers and grabbed the spotlight. They sat in silence. It wasn't half a wine cooler later that he got the first and then another. Carrie cited him for not letting her shine the light out so she could lend a hand, but no time to wait. Ron knew if he scuffled his boot on the porch, the sound would make the critters look their way, and the ambient light from the home would create eye shine and then boom, easy picking. About an hour or so, they counted four rats knocked off. They went out and eyeballed each kill and then tossed them into the pile and decided they would burn tomorrow night, a few days earlier than usual, since the corpses were piling up. No use adding disease to their plates, and there might be some more carnage. The motion light went on around 1 a.m. and Ron jumped out of bed. He was half awake anyways, as it was time for the nightly ritual of relieving himself. As he ran toward the window in the bedroom, he could hear some rustling outside, but could not see anything yet. They slept with the windows open in spring for the fresh, crisp air. He got to the window and saw the backyard all lit up, and that was it. He could still hear the rustling, and it was coming from the other side or the front of the house. Whatever it was, it was tearing through the brush and making a good racket. Carrie woke up about this time and watched Ron run to the living room and pull back the curtain. The racket continued a bit, but was getting fainter, and whatever it was was moving away. Ron then ran to the front door and hit the porch, grabbed his spotlight off the rail and shined it into the burn pile area nothing. Carrie was now standing next to Ron on the porch. Could have been hogs, I suppose, was all he said for the longest time. Carrie told me he was pissed and kind of freaked out, and just sat in a chair staring out into the field for at least 15 minutes. Let's go back to bed and sort this out in the morning. Ron was on the computer first thing in the morning. He decided it was hogs rooting around. As soon as he ate breakfast, he was out the door and headed over to the burn pile. He could see, as he approached, that it looked like it had been ransacked. Several very large and heavy charred tree trunks had been moved around. They were at least two to three hundred pounds each, and he could barely move them. Not hogs. On top of that, all the rats were gone, nowhere to be found and this time no dismembered head, not a trace they were even there. This was getting creepy and weird, and who the hell could move those trunks around? Certainly no known local predator or animal in general. The fact the carcasses were totally gone was sort of a relief because they could easily have been carried off by a scavenger. That part made sense. The previous random beheadings did not make sense, which made the overall series of events just plain weird. Based on the last few days of evidence, they decided to sit tight after dinner and stay inside and no shooting at the rats. Cut off the food source for whatever was out there 
and see if that would end the ordeal. A night of leftovers, a little TV, and cruising the internet to possibly shed more light on their dilemma. They decided to lock the barn for good measure as well, just in case. They both were awakened by the sound of something or someone jacking with the barn door. Sounded like someone trying to pull on the handles, and as they both bolted out of bed, the motion light came on. As soon as they got to the window, they had a clear view of the backyard and the barn. They saw nothing, and as they were standing, they, they heard a boom, loud as heck, and rattled the barn enough that there was dust flying off everywhere off the barn. More like an explosion than a boom, like someone crashed a truck or something into the side of the barn. And from the view they had of the barn, front and a left side, they knew whatever or whoever it was came from the rear or right side. And they were still there. That's enough of this. This is enough of this, screamed Ron. And he grabbed a trusty shotgun and flashlight they kept in the bedroom, threw on some clothes, and he was headed out the back door towards the barn. When he got about halfway to the barn, he stopped to listen for any sound of whatever or whoever made that crash. It was eerily quiet, no bugs, frogs, or any sound at all. Complete silence. He headed toward the side of the barn that was not visible from the bedroom, and told whoever was out there he had a gun, and they had better get out of Dodge. He took a deep breath and swung around the corner of the barn with flashlight on and nothing. A clear view from the corner to the back of the barn and nothing but his well-manicured side yard. He walked the back of the barn, looked around the corner, and still nothing. As he turns around and heads back to the front corner of the barn, he is shining his light up and down the side of the barn. As he's walking, and then he sees a big dent in the side of the barn about ten feet up. He is dumbfounded. The dent is about the size of a soccer or volleyball, and the wood is splintered. He just stares at it for at least a minute, and then shines the light on the ground to see what could have made the dent. Nothing again. He wasn't really sure what he was looking for anyways. No woods nearby, and nothing but corn on the sides and rear of the barn. Now he creeped out and calls for Carrie. She calls back out to him and says she's not coming out there. She's spooked, and by now, so is he. He continues to shine the light around and walks back over to the dent. He takes the shotgun and holds it by the butt end and moves it up the side of the barn and places it at the bottom of the impression, ten feet easily. I had no idea what or who could have done that, he later told me. There was no debris of any kind anywhere near that side of the barn. I began to get scared, and this feeling of unknown dread came over me. He stated, and there I was, standing there, starting to shake and quiver like a little scared rabbit. He collected himself as best as he could and decided to head back to the house. As he heads around the corner of the barn, he hears the most powerful scream he has ever heard in his life. It bounced off my chest, he told me. It was so loud, he could not figure out where it came from other than it was in front of him somewhere. He paused for a second, pointed his shotgun at absolutely nothing, then realized Carrie was still in the house, and he continued running toward her. She was already screaming and banging on the window. As soon as he burst in the house, she was in the living room waiting for him. She was pointing at the window on the side of the house that was facing the burn pile. Whatever that was, came from over there. As she pointed to the burn pile, Ron headed to the front door with Carrie right behind him. Adrenaline flowing. He grabbed the spotlight off the porch railing and handed Carrie the shotgun. He later told me his hands were shaking so bad he didn't want a gun in his hand. He shined the light at the pile and they both froze and stared at an unknown creature they had never seen or dreamed of. They both knew instantly what it was. They contacted me via email. They got my contact information from a friend of a friend who knew me quite well. My buddy had moved to Bentonville, Arkansas with his wife, and we always stayed in touch. 
He told me they were in a total panic and he needed to talk to someone soon. They sent a very long email, which was more a story than a report. They wrote down everything. I could have shortened it, but I left it as they sent it for the most part. I didn't want it to lose the personality. I called them and they relayed the whole week's events up to the sighting. So I was totally up to speed after about 15 minutes. I will get right to the description of the sighting. When he shined the light on the burn pile, he was drawn to a lone tree that was to the right of the pile. There, squatted down at the base of the tree, was a dingy white creature sitting against the tree with its long arms wrapped around its knees. It was holding a rat. There were some weeds and grass in front of the creature, and from the calves down, it was partially obscured. His first thought was, it was a person in a ghillie suit, and maybe they were out there to steal stuff, but that thought went away quickly. He yelled at the creature to get off their property, and then told Carrie to keep the gun pointed at the creature. He took another step or two, then the creature stood up, turned, and ran into the woods to the right. It turned and looked their way one time and was gone. The description was as follows. By the height of the trees and brush, the height was estimated at eight to nine feet tall. It had dingy, white, or maybe very light gray hair that looked like dreadlocks in several places. Could have been just matted with clumps of debris. It's hard to tell. Its eyes glowed a golden yellowish color, and they could not tell if it was from the light hitting it or if it was emanating from the creature. He later told me he thought that was a weird question. They could also see its teeth when they first saw it, and it almost seemed to be smiling or grimacing. The head was conical, and he described it looking like the old leather football helmets from way back, leathery and tough. They could not determine the gender. They weren't looking for that, and did note it was at least twice as wide as the tree it was standing by, which they both estimated was at least four feet wide. It was massive, was built, to tear stuff up, he told me. As we chatted, they told me they had been looking online to see what it may have been, and they did run across Sasquatch, but discounted it at first because no one around here had ever mentioned seeing one, or even knowing someone who had encountered one. Heck, they weren't even sure if Sasquatch was true. I did mention Falk, Arkansas, home of the Falk monster, and the film The Legend of Boggy Creek. They had heard of the movie, but thought it was just that, a movie. I mentioned that Falk was just 120 miles from them, and they inferred they had never been there. Up until a week or so ago, they had never seen or heard anything that would have put them on alert, other than the missing corn. And they had locked at the barn, which they rarely did, in case someone was after more corn. I asked if there was any large footprints around the home or if there was any deer poaching corn from the field. They couldn't tell me for sure, but were certain deer helped themselves to the corn and most likely on the back side of the property, further away from the main house. As far as large bare footprints, they never noticed and certainly weren't looking, but would be from here on out. They were totally blown away by the whole experience and were both quite shaken. It was not an area of interest to them, one way or another. I offered that those who lived in rural areas that grew large crops or raised livestock could easily be prone to some loss of both. It never occurred to them. I also suggested that locking the barn was a good idea for them to prevent theft of damage to crops and property stored there, but they may have possibly frustrated a Sasquatch who had easy access to food and perhaps a little shelter from time to time. The beheading of rat, I explained, was a usual and customary rite of eating small prey, easy to pop off the head, so as to not have to deal with a pesky, gnarling dinner as you chomp down. It is often reported it could have also been a territorial event to let other Sasquatch or other creatures stay away. They continued to lock the barn. I heard from them one more time about four months later, and things were normal as far as they could tell. They had sniffed around town quietly and found a few folks who would talk about it. 
people knew but didn't talk. Small towns make fun of the oddballs. I never heard from them after that. No more news was good news, I suppose. On to the next one. The year was 2008. It was an early fall evening, and I was on Highway 59 South, headed for Hanobia Creek, Oklahoma, in the Kiamichi Mountains. That stretch of highway is one of the most scenic drives in the state. Every year, thousands of people make the trip just for the fall foliage. I was headed out to meet up with a group of friends and spend the weekend riding four-wheelers over the mountain trails. I was coming from a different direction than the others, so I arrived before everyone else. My buddy owned two cabins, one on one of the mountains just above Old Hanobia Creek Cabin Store a few miles back. As you pass by the store and start going up the mountain, you have to slow down to find the logging road leading back to the cabins. It's a hidden road. Not on purpose. It's just hard to find unless you know what you're looking for. The road winds around in and out of the trees with switchback hairpin turns over ruts and stumps. It's rugged. I drove a four-wheel truck drive with a flatbed trailer hauling three four-wheelers. I had to take my time to get through there. It was dark by 10 p.m., with no moon or stars, so anything beyond the headlight beams was pitch black. The mountains made it seem darker still. I got to the first cabin, backed up, and got my trailer parked alongside the house when I realized I didn't have a key. I would have to wait on the rest of the guys to get there, and of course, there is no cell service. I killed the engine, but my dash light and radio remained on about 15 minutes before they went off automatically. I sat there listening to the radio until it finally turned off. When it did, it pitched me into inky darkness so black, I literally could not see my hand in front of my face. To be honest, it was pretty spooky. I sat there a few minutes when I started getting this uncomfortable, queasy feeling. I realized that you can be your own worst enemy in situations like that. Your mind can play tricks on you, and you can end up talking yourself into or out of some of those feelings. Possibly that's what I did. I reached into my console and pulled out my 45 and put it on my lap. You know, just in case. I had my windows down, and I could hear all the usual night sounds. Crickets, cicadas, bullfrogs croaking. I mean, everything is alive in this pitch black world. I kicked back in my seat and started to relax a bit. Suddenly, a limb snapped and I sat bolt upright in full alert. It came from over on my left side, just behind the cabin. I didn't have my flashlight out because it was stowed away in my bag in the back seat somewhere. So I didn't even bother to reach for it. I still figured that the guys would be along any minute. It was probably just a raccoon or maybe a possum, no big deal. A few minutes later, I heard the crunch of dried leaves. The sound came from that same area. This time, it didn't sound small. A million things ran through my head. I knew there were bears and mountain lions in those woods. We've seen hundreds of tracks before. Even though we're always at the cabin, under the guise of Bigfoot hunting, we really used it as an excuse to go down there to ride four-wheelers, fish, and drink beer. I wasn't really worried about what I heard, and I felt pretty comfortable with my 45 on my lap. I know none of the guys were there yet because I would have seen their vehicles. There's nowhere else to park except in front of the cabin, so it's not them trying to scare me. I relaxed back into the seat and started thinking about the weekend. A few minutes later, I heard this crunch of two more steps. This time, I'm positive they're steps and not a general rustling sound made by animals moving in the dried leaves. I remember I had this weird feeling again, very tense, almost agitated. I could feel my skin tingling, like a slight jolt of electricity. 
a peculiar sense. That's when I noticed that it had gone silent. The crickets, cicadas, and bullfrogs all stopped, nothing but deadly silence. Someone or something was out there. I heard another step, crunch. It sounded like it was just a few feet from my window, but I didn't have a flashlight to check it out, and I didn't want to turn on my headlights because as dark as it was when all the dashlights came on, they may blind me. I heard another crunch of leaves, and then I felt this presence right beside me, standing right by my door. It filled the entire window, looming over me in the darkness. The truck rocked ever so slightly, and I knew something was there, just inches away, and I guess I froze in fear. I'm sure I still had my forty-five in my lap, but never thought of using it. The next thing I knew... I was parked at the Hanobius door. I was breathing hard, trying to catch my breath, but I don't know how the heck I got out of there. It was like I had some kind of panic attack. My gun was lying in the seat beside me, the trailer with the four-wheelers still attached to my truck. Everything else was blank. I could not remember how I got there. I suppose the fear was so overwhelming that my only reaction was to run. I can't remember any time in my life that I was afraid to be in the woods. I've spent days alone on hunts, overnight camping. I don't get scared easily, especially if I'm carrying a gun. I'm not afraid of anything in the woods. I've never lost my sensibilities whatsoever for any reason. But I still can't fathom what happened on that trip to Hanobia Creek. On to the next one. In the summer of 2001, I came home late one night from a fishing trip. It was about 2 a.m. and, of course, my wife was in bed asleep and the house was dark. When I checked the baby's room, I saw that he wasn't in his crib. I quietly looked in and, sure enough, he was in bed with Mama. I didn't want to wake them, so I went to the guest room in the back of the house, showered, and went to bed. Our house has wooden floors with a crawl space underneath. Though solid, when someone walked in one part of the house, another person could hear the footsteps on the other and if it were quiet inside. I had just lain down and pulled the covers up when I heard footsteps. I was facing the wall with my back to the open door. I thought maybe my wife had gotten up and was coming to check on me. Then the footsteps quickened into a run bounding down the hallway and into my room. They were so fast that I didn't have time to react. In the next instant, something solid and heavy jumped on top of me, pinning me down. I was wide awake. The room was not completely dark as the yard light outside shined in through the window blinds, but I was frozen. I couldn't speak, couldn't move, couldn't breathe. Something held me down so hard that it felt like I was suffocating, but I couldn't see anyone there. I could see everything in the room, the dresser, the chest of drawers that stood at the end of the bed, the nightstand with the fan on top, but I couldn't see any person or anything. This lasted for at least several seconds when, just as suddenly as it came, it was gone. I could move again. As soon as it let go, I spun over, throwing the blanket off, with my fist up, ready to hit someone, but no one was there. I was trembling, shaking from panic and anger. My heart was racing. I jumped out of bed, turned on the light, and immediately searched the entire house. My wife and son were sleeping peacefully, but I never heard or saw anyone. Sleep paralysis is a common condition identified by the medical industry as having a brief loss of muscle control after falling asleep or waking up. During this state, the victim may experience hallucinations. Long ago, and before modern science discovered the cause of sleep paralysis, there were many contrived explanations for the phenomenon. One in particular was so prevalent that the occurrence is often referred to by name the old hag syndrome. People thought that the feeling of intense pressure on one's chest was the physical manifestation of an evil spirit in the form of an old hag crushing its victim. 
There have been many reports of demonic visitations as well as alien abductions and out-of-body experiences during episodes. On to the next one. Late one evening, my wife and I were driving home from being out shopping in Fort Smith. We stopped at a convenience store just west of Stillwell on Highway 100. It was winter because I remember there was a foggy mist that night. I pulled up to the gas pump and my wife went inside to get something to drink. The highway was deserted. There were no other cars in the street and only one was parked in the back of the store, which I assumed belonged to the clerk. I stood outside and finished pumping gas, not paying attention to anything in particular. I watched my wife pay for her stuff and chat with the clerk inside when this weird sense came over me. You know, it's like a low noise that you can't hear, but you can feel it. Very eerie. I looked around thinking that maybe someone started a big truck or something nearby that I couldn't see. It shook the ground somehow, but it was so low-pitched that it made me feel queasy. My wife finished paying for her stuff, walked out the front door, immediately looked up and froze. I was under the awning over the gas pump, so I walked over to her and looked up. At first, I couldn't see anything. It took a moment to realize why. Above us, no more than a couple hundred feet was a ship. I say ship because it was so huge, it blotted out the entire night sky. It didn't have any lights on it, but we could see the bottom of this massive ship. It was dark gray against the streetlights that illuminated it. That's how low to the ground it was, and it was moving very slowly. We could make out different areas like indications in the hull, panel openings, and what looked like section lines running along the bottom. We knew that it wasn't anything man-made. There's no way something that big would have to have had rocket engines propelling it, but it didn't. We couldn't make out any engines at all, but it was moving slowly but surely. We watched it for a couple of minutes as it passed over and then, just like that, it was gone. No more queasy feeling or sound pressure. It was just gone. We both saw it and can attest to that, but we never heard of anyone else reporting anything that night. On to the next one. I used to be a climber back in my youth, but one small mistake put an end to that. After six broken bones and three months in a hospital, I lost interest in climbing. Some of my friends told me I should go back, that I shouldn't let fear defeat me, but I refused. And I will say that a couple of them are now dead from climbing accidents. But just because I didn't want to climb anymore, that didn't mean I still didn't want to be out in nature, go to the mountains and camp. I still loved all that. And there was no way I was giving that up. So I continued to backpack and hike and hang out with my climbing buddies. I would help plan trips and do whatever I could to be part of the team. And that sometimes meant being the first safety belay at the bottom of the climb. But after that, they did their thing and I did mine, which usually meant I did day hike and explorations while they climbed. I had climbed in Wyoming's Wind River Mountains many times before my accident, and I still love that area. So when my good friend Chris and Emma said they were putting together a small group to go climb, I jumped at the chance to go along. We would pack up to the Cirque of the Towers, and they would climb while I enjoyed the scenery and did some hiking. I had discovered the world of photography and wanted to go up there and take some photos. The winds is a stunning place, they had wrangled up two more friends to go, so that made five of us total. Since they were coming down from Seattle, and I was living in Boulder at the time, we agreed to meet in the little town of Pinedale, Wyoming, and spend our first night near there, making plans and checking gear and all that. We met at the Wind River Brewing Company, the western gateway to the winds. I think the brewing company was worth the trip itself, with good food 
an even better brew. We talked a while and got caught up on what we'd been doing since we last met, and then headed out the road that led up to Big Sandy Campground, a good 50 or so miles from town, with the last 10 miles being pretty rough going. By the time we reached the campground, we were all totally beat, so we made a quick camp and crashed for the night. This is the most common way into the Thirk of the Towers, which is a pretty famous climbing area at the southern end of the range. The winds are really rugged, and the Thirk is one of the more rugged areas there, a place where glacial action has carved Thirks and kettles and hanging valleys. It's a breathtaking semicircle of 15 craggy peaks all above 12,000 feet and it offers some of the best alpine granite rock climbing in the U.S. We got up the next morning and repacked our tent and gear, then headed up the trail. There were a lot of cars in the parking lot, but we really didn't see hardly anyone the whole trip. The Bridger Wilderness is a huge area and can accommodate a lot of backpackers. We started out at around 9,000 feet, heading for a mountain path that goes through and climbs to 10,800 feet. It's a long hike back in there, about nine miles one way, but the first six miles were easy, pretty flat, following the Big Sandy River. We reached Big Sandy Lake, which is really pretty, and took a break there, then continued on. One of the waiters at the brewing company was a climber on his free time, and he told us the lake has tons of black bears around. He also told us that the talk of the whole summer was about a black bear that had been seen climbing in the cirque several times, and at one point, it was going up a pretty steep route, which was rated a 5.1. In climbing talk, anytime you get to a 5.0 and above, you're talking technical climbing, where aid is necessary. Apparently, that bear didn't read the climbing manual because it was climbing without aid. People do climb some of the five plus stuff without ropes and such, but they're doomed if they slip even once. So we took a break and talked about the climbing bear. I kind of hoped we would see it as it would make some awesome photos. The lake is really pretty and a precursor of what was to come reflecting the big grand monolith of Big Sandy Mountain, Haystack Mountain, Scheistler Peak, and Temple and East Temple Peak. And now for the fun part. This path was called Jackass Path. Supposedly, it got its name because only a donkey could travel it. Or maybe, in our case, a dumbass. Because it's one heck of a path. It's steep and rocky and a real trial when you're loaded down with a backpack. Actually, it would be bad enough without all the weight, but it's worth it, especially when you top out and are now looking right into the maw of the Cirque of the Towers, a semicircle ridge of jagged peaks, including some with really cool names like War Bonnet and Wolf's Head. We could also see down to Lonesome Lake where we would camp. I can't begin to describe this view. It's absolutely stunning. Tundra glacier, and granite. We headed down and set up camp, not too close to the lake, as you're not supposed to camp there in order to keep it pristine. We had a huge dinner of fajitas. We were deep in a place that felt like paradise, and we were late enough in the season, mid-September, that the infamous mosquitoes were all gone. It would be only a matter of a few weeks until the first snows shut the place down. We knew it was possible for early snows to hit when we were there, but the lack of bugs and people made it worth the risk. I had been in there once in the same time of year with a climbing buddy back when I climbed, and we'd ended up wading out through two feet of snow. Because the cirque is high in the tundra and there aren't any trees to hang food from, we had brought along some bear-proof portable food storage containers, which added to our load but ensured we'd have something to eat if bears did come around. The bears and the winds include grizzlies, and they're getting too used to humans. We didn't want any encounters, although I was still hoping for that climbing bear the guy in town had mentioned. I had been there one year 
when the Grizzlies were pretty bad, coming into camp and looking for food. But the guy at the brew pub had said this year they seemed to have backed off some, maybe because the climbers were being fined if they left trash or food around and the wildlife people were up there enforcing it. There was one other party camped not too far away and I ambled over and talked to them for a bit, but they hadn't seen any bears nor heard of the climbing bear. We all laughed about it, but I knew the waiter had been serious and wasn't pulling my leg. My group was there to climb Pingora, the central tower in the Cirque, and one of the more famous climbs. Pingora has a rating ranging from 5.2 to 5.11. It's not the highest, but is probably the most eye-catching peak in the ring of towering spires and has one of the easiest approaches. Well, you would think I would have slept like a baby that night after hiking nine miles carrying a heavy pack, but I didn't. First off, I couldn't go to sleep, and when I finally did, I suddenly woke around midnight with a strange feeling of dread. I lay there wondering if I were somehow having one of those premonitions people talk about where they feel like something bad is going to happen and then it does. I wondered if I shouldn't tell everyone what I was feeling and tell them not to go climbing. But then after some thought, I figured it was the thin air up there, the lack of oxygen. I lay there thinking like that, recalling a story. I heard once about someone having a premonition about some loved one dying in a plane crash and telling them not to go. And sure enough, the plane crashes and they would have died. I then heard a deep sigh, like some really big animal nearby. Uh-oh, bear, was my first thought, hoping it wasn't a grizzly. I lay there really still, wondering if anyone else was awake. I made sure my bear spray was nearby, then tried to relax and listen. Was I just exhausted and my mind playing tricks on me? Or was it really something? Next, I heard something walking around camp, circling the perimeter of our tent, which we'd set up like a circled wagon out in the wilderness. The feeling of dread got heavier. That's the only way I could describe it. As I lay there, I could now hear whatever it was making the strangest sound I've ever heard. It's like it was talking to itself, but in a really soft whispering note. I don't know what to compare it to except the sound a monkey makes, only deeper and huskier. I turned over onto my side, trying to listen better, and all of a sudden, I felt really groggy and wanted nothing more than to sleep. But all of my senses said I had to stay awake, or I would die. Have you ever driven? When you were so tired, you knew you were a hazard, but you kept going? Like you would pinch yourself, turn on the radio, open the windows, anything to wake up. And you knew you would die if you nodded off, but you're so groggy, it made it feel like you were dreaming. That's what I felt like. I managed to stay awake, and the whispering sound was now returned by something further out of camp. It was like they were talking to each other, whatever they were. I then heard something actually scrape by my tent, brushing it as they went by. I was still groggy, but the terror of being eaten by a grizzly was enough to keep me awake. I recalled the previous summer when a guy camped in a primitive campground in Yellowstone was killed by a grizzly. The last thing I remember was hearing something making a forlorn howling out away from camp quite a ways, and it sounded like a mixture of a wolf and a human, like something from a Lon Chaney werewolf movie. It gave me chills and terrified me, but I could no longer stay awake and went to sleep. The next morning, about 5 a.m., I was wakened by everyone getting up to go climb. You know how it is when you first wake up after something bad's happened the previous day? You know something's wrong, but your mind hasn't remembered exactly what it is yet. Then, after a moment, you remember, and it's like, oh, oh no. Well, for a moment, I sort of luxuriated in not having to get up and in being able to just laze around and sleep in. Of course, having been a climber, I knew my friends would be rewarded when they reached the summit. But 
I was happy to spend a day hiking and taking photos. I no longer needed that adrenaline rush or feeling of accomplishment. But then I suddenly sat straight up in my bag, remembering the events of the previous night. The chill came back and I got up, not wanting to be alone in camp, deciding I would hike with them to Pingora. But it was too late. They were long gone. I got up and made some coffee. I was scared stiff with it still being dark and everyone gone. And I even thought about packing up and heading back to the car. Instead, I just sat there, wrapped up in my down coat against the night chill until the sun finally came up. I could now see over to the other camp and it was empty. Also, as they were going to climb the face of Warbonnet, a tougher climb than Pingora. I had the valley all to myself and I would normally be really relishing that. But now it felt ominous. As the sun came up and everything looked more normal, I gradually began to feel better. I didn't want to sit around all day worrying, so I got my day pack, put in some snacks and water and camera gear, and then headed out. I would just wander around, climb up the slopes a bit from the valley and take photos. I was beginning to feel more normal. I was in one of the most stunning landscapes on earth, and I should enjoy it. I headed for Pingora. I wanted to hike around its base to get a good view of Wolf's Head, a big massive of granite that was another famous climb. The morning was chilly with clear skies, and I hoped also to see my friends on Pingora and get some photos for them to check out later. I wanted to be close to them as I felt really unsettled. I headed out and the movement made me feel better, got the blood going a bit. I was analyzing the previous night and I would swear we'd been visited by a bear except for the whispering and the weird howl which mystified me. I had no idea what it could be. I gradually worked my way to the base of Pingora, but over towards the side where a rough rocky valley went on up to Wolf's Head. I stopped to take some photos and I was close enough that I could see Pingora really well and I thought I saw climbers. I pulled my Nikon high-powered binoculars from my pack and started watching them. Sure enough, it was my buddies. I could tell from the number in the group and the bright red jacket that Emma always wore. They had made really good progress and looked like they were doing great. I took off my pack and sat down on a big rock, getting comfortable. I wanted to get more photos, plus I really felt unmotivated and tired. As I sat there, scanning the face of Pingora with, with my binoculars, something caught my eye. Something way over to the left of my group, also on Pingora, climbing. Maybe someone else is climbing that we hadn't met yet. I thought, wondering where they had camped, I looked closer. It appeared to be just one person, a solo climber, and they were all dressed in brown and bulky. The best climbers tend to be small and wiry, though. Though there are exceptions, and this guy looked like a big exception. And man, he was hauling butt right up that route, really moving. It then dawned on me that he was free climbing, something that gives me the chill. I wanted to stop watching, but I couldn't. The last thing I wanted to see was someone fall to their death. Whatever this was, he was the best climber I'd ever seen. His motions were fluid and smooth and he climbed like a monkey. Before long, he wasn't that far from my friends and could see they had stopped. Apparently, they also saw this guy climbing. I could imagine what they must have thought, this big, burly guy free climbing not far from them and going straight up that wall like it was nothing. I thought for a moment about the climbing bear and wondered, nah, no way a bear could climb like that. And this guy was on a route that looked way harder than a 5.1. I took some photos, but later when I saw them, I was disappointed as my 300 millimeter lens wasn't long enough to really capture much of anything. It just looked like a big guy climbing. But those photos at least proved that I didn't make up the darn thing. For a while, it looked like the guy was angling over to my friends, which I thought was kind of strange but maybe he was following a crack or something. 
Emma and everyone had completely stopped climbing and were just watching the sky from what I could make out. He wasn't too far from them when I heard that same howling I'd heard last night. And it was coming from the sky. That was too weird for me. Of course, your mind tries to make things logical, and I thought, what the heck was this big guy doing messing around our camp last night? Not cool. What I thought later was simply how close we'd been to a Sasquatch, and what a scary yet unique event it had been. But at the time, my mind couldn't register what I was seeing. Now, the guy was climbing even faster and was soon gone over the top of Pingora. I was shocked. No human could possibly climb so easily and fast. Now my friends were rappelling down off the face, coming down pretty fast. They had decided not to finish their climb. I couldn't see where this guy had gone, but I was worried. He was coming down the back side and might have come right around my way as it was the route back to the valley. I picked up my gear and took off back to camp. When I got there, I started packing up. When I got there, I started packing up. There was no way I was going to stay, even if I had to hike out alone. It was a couple of hours later before my friends got back early afternoon and they were a pretty shook up bunch. Nobody said much. They just started packing up camp. They were ready to go too. By the time they were ready to head out, the other climbers had returned. So I went over to talk to them. They had a successful climb and were high as kites. I told them about the previous night and what we'd seen, but they thought I was kidding. I guess because they didn't seem to let it faze them. We said our goodbyes and my group and I headed out. Climbing back up, the path was grueling for my friends, as they had just climbed part of Pingora, but we made good time, no one saying a word. I kept looking behind us, worried we might be followed, but I never saw anything. We got back to our vehicles, then piled in and headed for Pinedale, where we got spaces in an RV park. I think it was the first time any of us had ever stayed in an RV park, but it seemed pretty nice being surrounded by people. I didn't even mind the sounds of generators and barking dogs and kids yelling. It all kind of comforted me. Normally, I would move camp if I could even see anyone in the distance, and my friends were all the same. We ended up back at the brewery for dinner, and that same waiter served us, surprised to see us back so soon. I told him we'd seen the climbing bear, but it wasn't a bear. He just laughed. He'd known all along but didn't believe it. But I think our recounting of the day's events may have helped change his mind. Anyway, that was my last visit into the wind. Between my knee starting to hurt after long hikes and the climbing bear, I've lost interest in doing anything but lowland desert hikes and then in moderation. After I got home, I got on the internet and checked things out. I actually found a reference to that climbing bear on a rock climbing site. So I knew we weren't the only ones who had seen it. But on the other hand, there was also some threads about actual bears being able to climb up to a 5.7, which, which kind of blew my mind. In any case, I hope that climbing bear was just out having a good day and never crashes and burns like I did. On to the next one. Neosho, Missouri. I used to live there in the early 2000s. I used to deliver pizzas and got off late in the evening. Same route home every night. A quarter of a mile before my driveway was a sharp left turn with a big evergreen tree. On the outside of the corner, one night, I was coming to that corner and noticed forward-facing eyes shining from within the base of the big evergreen. As I approached, I was looking intently for what little critter it was as I am a nature lover. The closer I get, I am having a very hard time seeing what it was, and in hindsight, it's because my brain wasn't processing what I was seeing very well initially. As I got 
right up to the turn I saw it in full. My best description is a goat boy, a pan-like creature, human head very small with reflective eyes, a small torso that was pale in complexion and brown hairy legs and little tiny hooves. I almost came to a complete stop looking at it. I didn't know what I was looking at until I took the turn. My headlights were now off it directly, and it was looking at me with the ambient light in the car through the passenger window. At that point, we had made eye contact, and I became terrified and floored it. I had a vision of my family and friends finding me in the woods dead. I ran into my house, freaking out and told my wife and two friends there at the time. Of course, it was laughed off and I'm just tripping. My neighbor and friend at the time then heard about my story and was like, man, you ever heard the screams that come from the woods behind the townhouses? I actually had not, but he was adamant that he had heard something back there multiple times that was not a North American animal. Then, about two months later, one of the friends that was at my house that night was at his dad's house telling the story about me and his dad over years and looks at him sharply and asks, how the heck did he know about that creature? He then tells him that when he was a kid, him and his friends used to party out there. There wasn't anything built out there back then, except a little dirt road, and this is in the 70s. One night, him and his buddies were sitting around the fire, and he had to take a whiz. One of his buddies did too. They got up, walked 10 yards, and let her rip. He said he'll never forget what he saw next, or how it sounded. Mid-dream, the small, three-foot goat boy ran out of the woods, screamed this god-awful scream at them, and then ran off into the woods. They all packed up and never came back. That place where they partied was less than a hundred yards from the tree I saw it in. To this day, I can vividly remember it standing there. I don't tell too many folks about that. On to the next one. My wife and I purchased three acres on a small lake near Rushville, Illinois. It was all just timber and adjoining a small hill range that followed the Illinois River about two miles away. That extended at least 100 miles long to around Alton, Illinois. We hired a friend of ours to bring his cat nine bulldozer in and build us a huge circle drive and a huge level pad down in the timber with a small pad for a yard. And I cut a path about 150 yards long through the timber down a huge hillside to the lake where I built a dock for fishing and to keep a small fishing boat. We had a small camper and a one-bedroom mobile home that we'd put on the pad for camping. We had no electricity or running water because at that time we couldn't afford to install them. So we used candles and carried in water when we camped there. We camped and fished there on the weekends for four or five years without incident, but it was always an eerie place at night. If we could not go up on a given weekend, I would loan it out to some of our friends to go camping. One weekend, we loaned it to a lady I worked with and her husband. They had used it several times before. When she came to work Monday morning, she gave me back the keys and told me that they would never be using it again, that they had left and left their stuff there and asked if I could bring it to them that her husband had encountered something on his way to the dock at about midnight, and all he would tell her is that it stood upright, was tall and hairy, 
and had glowing, yellow-green, glowing eyes. They never went back. But I just blew it off because I didn't ever see anything myself. And I was not the least bit scared of a night in the woods. About two months later, we were there in August, and the night there was a full moon. It was a beautiful, warm night, and we had a nice campfire going. Around the mowed perimeter of the campsite, I had kerosene torches lit to give us some light. Past the torches was just thick, old timber. I went behind the camper to relieve myself by the woods, and while I was doing so, I had an eerie feeling come over me that something was watching me. So, when I was done, I walked the tree line looking into the wood to see if I could see anything. I couldn't see anything but the reflection of the torches in the thick trees, but I could hear heavy footsteps in the timber. When I stopped, they stopped. When I turned around and went back, they turned around and went back. It really freaked me out. Something was stalking me. I was sure of that. But I would never get to where I could see it in the torchlight. I went back to the campfire, which was between the camper and the one-bedroom mobile home. And I told my wife that something was out there and it sounded huge. I told her I was not staying the night. So we locked the door on the mobile home, got in the truck, and drove the 35 miles to the small town we lived in. We left the torches burning and the campfire surrounded by concrete blocks burning. We decided the next morning to go back up there to make sure everything was all right and retrieve our supplies, cooler, fishing equipment, and everything else. When we got there and pulled down the one-lane road through the woods, I could see stuff strewn around on the ground. The torches and campfire had all burned out. When we got down to where we parked, I could see the little camper was untouched, but the metal door on the mobile home was hanging almost torn off by one hinge, and the inside screen door was completely destroyed. I got my pistol from my truck and went inside. It was torn to pieces. Even the kitchen sink was torn out, lying on the floor. The couch was shredded. The little kitchen table was smashed. Even some of the paneling was broken and torn off the wall. Then I went into the little bathroom. The sink had been torn out and was gone. In the little bedroom past the bathroom, the bed was shredded and a mirror on the wall smashed. I was in shock. This had to have been something very strong to rip those things out. The press board wood that they were made of was just splintered. Like you hooked a chain to the sink and to your truck and just drove off, ripping it apart. So he drove about five miles into town and went to the police station to report it. Two deputies followed us back out to the campsite and went through everything to investigate. They told me all they could think of was maybe it was done by teenagers high on meth. We even walked out in the timber to try to find tracks. It was very dry out and the clay ground was hard, so we found nothing. But we did find the little bathroom sink out there. We never stayed there again. I went up and tore apart the rest of the mobile home, all during the daytime hours and never alone, and gave the frame to a guy to make a trailer out of, and we lifted the property with a realtor and sold it. That was over 30 years ago. I drove past it recently, and whomever bought it did nothing with it. It is all grown up and unrecognizable now. The police never found anything, and I haven't spoken about it for years. I found that even though I had proof of the destruction, people I told the story to thought I was crazy. One guy told me he thought it was a werewolf. I never found out. I still don't fish at night and don't stay out much at night 
especially during a full moon, which I used to love. On to the next one. My name is Richard Carter, and last fall, I had the honor of attending a meeting of many important people in a council for Native Americans. This is a close group to which a good friend of mine belongs, and since he knows how much I like exploring, he thought I'd enjoy a project they were planning to announce. I will not use the full name of this group, as they are quietly working behind the scenes to secure a large grant for a project to explore one of the most remote desert areas where the ancient people dwelled. I will refer to my friend by his Christian name of John, as this information is extremely sensitive while this project is still being formulated. I feel that after such a frightening experience that I must tell someone. After three days of meetings, lectures, and more meetings of which I was allowed to attend only certain less important and informal talks, John seemed very pleased with the decisions that were made. As we were heading back to our motel, after the final lecture, John asked me to join him and two others for some exploring. To this, I readily agreed, as I had brought camping gear just in case John was able to get us permission to partake in what he had previously referred to only as a side trip. It was not a part of the main project that was geared toward building and staffing a cultural center, and John told me that this was an exploration of the area that had been off limits to everyone because it was a heretofore unexplored area that had never drawn any attention due to its remoteness and the absolute refusal of the tribes involved in this event to allow access to this canyon they refer to as Hacienda El Diablo. My friend is part Navajo, and his family claims to be descendant from the Aztecs, and the other two men joined us were connected to the Council for the Native People, which I had no real interest in. I was just glad I was going. So it was John, Ike, Joaquin, and myself who had the pleasure of this exploration. Two days later, I found us in a helicopter, headed over some of the worst badlands I've ever seen. We were in the southwestern area of Colorado, and I believe near the four corners where the states come together. Since I had agreed never to disclose anything that I might see, I tried to look disinterested to the others, but inside I was shaking with excitement. This really seemed to be a trip of more importance than they were letting on. Soon, the pilot announced for us to secure all equipment and buckle in as we were nearing our departure zone. Looking out of the window, all I could see was a somewhat wide, flat spot between two enormous peaks of reddish rock, and that was where we were dropped. Dropped is a good word, because they didn't even shut off the engine, just helped us unload our gear and lift it up without hardly a wave goodbye. And there we stood. Since I was the novice in the group, the others must have sensed my concern in being so quickly ushered out into this flat mesa. As one of the group, Joaquin, casually said something like, guess they must be scared of the skinwalkers. The other three laughed, and I responded with, what's that? The others seemed to relish in the mystery, and the fourth man, Ike, which was a nickname for Isaiah, explained it was an ancient witch that his people believed watches over the sacred places where the old ones dwelled. They told me that it was simply superstition and nothing to worry about. John got us started on our way by reminding us we only had four days to check out the entire canyon. I asked why we were limited to four days, and John explained that the National Weather Service reported an impending storm, front due in, and we sure didn't want to be in this canyon when it hit. With that, we began a gradual descent on what proved to be an easy walk downward into a gradually winding canyon. The slope was smooth, and our hiking shoes had little trouble with the sandstone surface. Everywhere I looked, there was another weathered rock formation, and I passed my time comparing the varying shapes of these monoliths to animals, dinosaurs, and whatever else my fertile imagination could conjure up. We spoke very little, as each of us was concentrating on our own descent as now the downward slant had steepened 
and we found ourselves crisscrossing the slopes at angles to lessen the strain on our legs and backs. The target of the flat canyon floor was still a hundred feet away when I lost my footing and flopped on my butt, but my slide continued. John yelled to me to keep my feet flat, and I quickly brought my feet up in contact with the coarse red rock, and soon I was stopped with only a sore bottom and the embarrassment of being the city slicker of the outfit. John helped me to regain my feet, and we continued our crisscrossing until we finally were all standing on a flat and broad canyon floor covered with centuries of soft sand that had blown off the surrounding sandstone walls. We all gathered around a sort of table-like boulder where I could produce a large contour map and we all studied it. I just looked at it to pretend to have an understanding, while the others seemed as though they were all able to connect the countless contour lines into something understandable. The general consensus was that we would take the canyon to our left, and it soon appeared to be a good decision, because the trek was an easy walk through a steadily curving, meandering, high-walled canyon that one could only realize was dropping in altitude by looking behind, which I frequently did. I assumed that the others knew that we were steadily descending, but no one else was even looking back. Being more or less of a guest of these experienced explorers, I had to put my trust in the fact that they knew what they were doing. We stopped on occasion for a sip of water and a snack, and then it was back to the monotonous march forward. But to what? I still didn't know. John had forewarned me that he had pulled a lot of strings with his people to invite me on this trip, so out of courtesy, I accepted the fact that I would be told what I needed to know at the point I really needed to. It was 4.30 in the afternoon when the deep canyon began to cast wicked shadows around every curve, and I had a sudden thought that we may have well been on another planet because even a plane flying over couldn't have seen us. Then I had visions of a possible rainstorm and a 50-foot wall of water heading down toward us. Fortunately for me, before I started going out of my mind, Ike broke the silence, suggesting we make our way up onto the ledge above us. That looked like a good spot to spend the night. I almost cheered as we easily climbed up to reach a flat shelf that was about 20 feet above the floor and sat under a huge shelf of rock that acted like canopy over us. Joaquin thought this would be the ideal location to protect us from any falling rocks. This pleased me immediately, because up until now, I was wondering if I was the only one who had thought of these things. We unpacked, spread out our light sleeping bags, and rustled through our packs to produce the provisions that were carefully divided among the four of us out of weight concerns. Whoever had provided and packed these communal packs had a lot of experience. Until this moment, I had no idea if they even contained food. Since we were all in the same position of trusting to our outfitters, it was an adventure for all of us to sort through everything. I could see that my companions had obviously done this many times before as we prepared our meals and sleeping arrangements. One pack held what I described as our lifeline, a satellite phone. In all the excitement, I automatically figured that our rendezvous point would be back where we started, but it was soon explained to me that our departure would be in four days, but we would be much too far away to try retracing our step, so we would be picked up somewhere ahead of where we were now. It was like a normal camping trip so far, with the exception of continually hiking with few stops. It was certainly an adventure, and it seemed like I had laid my head down to sleep when I heard John say, wake up, city slicker. We had retired just after dinner the night before without much conversation, but now we were able to walk abreast in the ever-widening canyon. The conversation began to flow. I learned that the plateau we were heading for had long been speculated to be some sort of ancient settlement due to tribal superstition and Bureau of Indian Affairs, along with the Bureau of Land Management, this entire area was unofficially referred to as the Forbidden Zone. It was sort of an unexplained reason that no one had ever been allowed to explore this entire canyon. 
And now our expedition had finally been sanctioned by all of bureaucracy as a joint exploration of significant importance. Okay, I thought, big deal. If some bureaucrats finally allowed its citizens to see their own country. It was kind of strange, but also I was selfishly gratified to be party to this excursion. So who was I to read more into it? Just as I was imagining all sorts of unknown discoveries we might make, I was reminded that a man had already defaced this place when we came upon a very old weather balloon that had landed on a snag about 15 feet above our trail. It was looped over a jagged rock outcropping on a ledge above us. We all saw humor in it and Joaquin said something along the line, the so much for being the first. We were making good time according to a GPS position that John was able to obtain with a satellite connection in the wide open area we were now in. That night, we had a more leisurely meal, and now that I'd earned my acceptance by the group, the true reason for our trip was discussed more openly. Neither John nor I had been told the true reason for this exploratory trip, and up until now, we thought it was a newly opened area and that our expedition was simply to verify that the canyons were safe for the public. It had made sense to us, but now Ike and Joaquin told us the rest of the reason for all the secrecy. They told us that now we had reached these present coordinates that they were free to tell us that there was another party that came this way six years before, and the five people had vanished without a trace. Several search parties were dispatched, but no sign of them had ever been found. No gear, no tracks, nothing. Since this group had no connection with the tribe or the government, there was no proof that these five people just didn't get back to civilization without saying anything. But they were still occasionally listed as missing, so hopefully our trip could solve the mystery. Slowly looking around, as though the answer to this mystery was somehow, was here somehow, both John and I were a bit unnerved to find out we were not here to research, but instead we were searching for a lost party and open to possible danger ourselves. Ike and Joaquin apologized for not telling us sooner, but both of us were secretly excited about such an adventure, so we weren't about to object. This was better than we could have hoped for. Even though both Ike and Joaquin had been told of the previous party that had disappeared, they had no further information about who they were at all. It seemed strange to John and me as we discussed the mystery of it all, but the other guys explained that the five seemed to have not left a record of whom they were or why they came here. People had only been aware of them disappearing. We decided to spend the night on this spot and we made a place for our camp. Then each of us took out a flashlight and extra batteries and separated into pairs. Joaquin and John and Ike and myself. Since there were two intersecting side canyons that had entered at this point, it was like a four-way intersection. It was now 3 p.m. and we agreed to check in different directions with the idea that if we found anything, we would give a blast on the small air horn cans that we had found in our backpacks. I'd wondered the night before how someone had thought to include these items but realized only a super loud blast could be heard in these deep, dark canyons. So it made sense as the sound seemed to muffle our voices without even an echo. Packing our individual backpacks and with each of us with our alert air horns in upper pockets and the large bolo knives the packs contained for cutting firewood or sage, we now strapped on our belt. John and Joaquin headed off into the canyon on the left and Ike and I took the one on the right. We agreed that after a maximum of three hours, no matter what we found, we'd return for the other half of our party. So off we went. Ike and I had walked at a cautious pace for a long while, and there were no signs of any life whatsoever. No tracks, just windblown dirt. Suddenly, an air horn echoed through the canyon and kept reverberating off the massive collection of canyons and valleys above us. Ike and I spun around immediately and started running as fast as possible in this loose sand. We raced back toward our friends. We soon passed our campsite and were on a dead run down the other canyon. The going was tough as we were pumping hard in the soft sand, slowing at times to catch our breath and then continued as best as we could. 
We must have been close to collapsing when suddenly, on the trail ahead, we saw a tall, dark creature that appeared to be a thin, gaunt, wolfen-like beast that defies description. It was standing over the bodies of our two companions, and as we came nearer, we could see that there had been a violent struggle. Our friends were both covering their heads from the obvious attack, but they were both moving in an attempt to get up. The attacker, upon seeing us running in at it, immediately pulled itself back into a defensive position and turned before we could get close, and it sped down the canyon, and suddenly it just jumped into the air. The creature that appeared to be over five feet high and somehow turned into a large raven or vulture-like bird. The strange beast flipped its way upward until it had reached the uppermost ridge and it then flew over the top. We were still watching as it disappeared from sight in case it should come back. The willowy, gangly being appeared to have a large black beak and very long, sharp claws. Other than that, Further description seems impossible. John and Joaquin were both bleeding from multiple cuts and slashes, but they were mostly small wounds that we were able to treat. When we were through patching them up, we had used most of the entire contents of all four first aid kits. The guys looked almost like mummies by the time we were finished, but they both were anxious to show us their discovery. Using all four flashlights, we followed the guys to a large overhang where we had to duck to get under it, and there appeared a large cavern-like cut that had been eroded about four feet deep. Inside, we found two empty backpacks, three hiking shoes, miscellaneous bones, and an odd collection of items. There was no identification we could find, and although the bones looked human, we decided our number one concern was getting medical help for John and Joaquin, so further exploration was out of the question. Being unsure of what kind of terrain lay ahead, we decided to return to our campsite where, before we had been able to establish a satellite connection, we made our way back as fast as Joaquin and John could travel, stopping often to allow them time to rest, and then we pushed on. Finally, we reached our campsite, and I climbed as high on the canyon wall as I could and trigger the send button on the satellite phone. I followed the instructions the guys had given me while Isaiah stayed behind to keep applying first aid to our comrades. Suddenly, the sat phone answered, and to my great relief, the voice on the other end came through perfectly clear. Talk about wonderful sound of civilization. It was enough to almost drive me to my knees. Within two hours, the reassuring sounds of the helicopter blades chattered into the air above our now reassuring signal fire and to our great relief a rescuer dropped on a tow line to begin hooking us up to get us out of this unwelcoming place in a little over three hours we were all four on the way out of this evil canyon and we flew directly to the hospital where the excellent staff immediately rushed our companions in for treatment we all survived this incident and there were a lot of questions from various groups that we tried our best to answer. We told them about the evil thing we had encountered and that we had found what we felt were human remains. I learned afterward that several more teams were soon dispatched to this area, but due to our experience, the further group were well armed. John did tell me a few months later that after four more groups went into this canyon, two men were found that they felt were part of the original group that we had searched for. But the bodies had no heads, no hands, and no feet. So comparing dental records and fingerprints was impossible. And they were still trying to identify them by other means. Further searches were not planned and everything connected with this area was now back under a blackout order. So John couldn't find out any more, even with his connections. I got together with John sometime later on and during dinner, he told me he had been holding some information back until we were face to face. Due to the secrets I was about to hear, before disclosing this information to me, John said he took what he had learned and then visited with an old family friend who had connections to some native people. John referred to as shadow people. I did not ask him to elaborate because his meaning was clear to me. These, shall I say, shamans or medicine men had confided in John 
as he had stronger connections to this tribe than I had previously known. His ancestral name was John Two Eagles, and he was taken into their confidence enough that they warned him to accept that these creatures who did these deeds were skinwalkers, thus explaining their shape-shifting ability. The ones who confided in John advised him to tell everyone to let it go and forget about it so that the evil will go back to rest in the dark canyons. John told me the story the night before he was going to meet with all of the project higher up, and he called me the next day to let me know they had agreed to cancel all further exploration of the area so we could all relax and not have to keep looking over our shoulders, fearing that every bird or animal was a shapeshifter. We all four got together some months later, and that was when they shared the rest of the truth with me. The whole truth this time, and under a vow of secrecy, sworn to by yours truly, I learned all I needed to know about skinwalkers and shapeshifters, of which I cannot and will not speak of any further. On to the next one. On a night out at sea, the weary sailor longing for home has stood alone upon the decks of his ship, wishing to be with his loved ones. Instead, strange fate and unexplainable love for the ocean pulls them away from a safe harbor and open hearts. Some unlucky enough to think to dark emotional depths have returned home to tell tales of demons, beasts, and things unknown to the average man. Of the ancient 17th century sailing vessel, in mint condition, searching forever, onward with no mind to stop or seek help, a feeling of dread fills the room at the mention of the name. It has been known to kill sailors, make entire crews disappear, and force a league of widows to join their husbands at the bottom of the sea. She is the Flying Dutchman. One fact has escaped most of us who have heard the legend in all the horror, folktale, and ghost stories. The Flying Dutchman is not a ship, but refers to a stubborn ship's captain who dared to challenge the god. His name was Captain Vanderdecken, and in 1641, he was the most experienced navigator to plot his way around Africa's Cape of Good Hope. He sailed the waters of his time with skill and the admiration of all. Admiration has sometimes been known to breed the emotions of arrogance and want. Legend had this mad Dutch captain battling a horrific storm on one of his many trips around the Horn of Africa with the new and untested crew. These men knew nothing about his cruel nature or the fact that he was a prideful navigator. All the crew did know was that the ongoing storm was powerful enough to destroy their ship. There were also paying passengers on their way to India. These concerned few joined forces with the crew begging the captain to turn around, to give up his traditional way past the horn. This is where there is confusion in the legend. Either the captain was heartbroken due to a new love turned sour, or he was just a plain old-fashioned drunk. In any case, the captain swore up at the storm, lit a pipe, and calmly retired to his cabin for the night. Orders were to stay the court, no matter the price, as the night moved on, the storm grew worse. Alarmed, the captain returned to the bridge. With tears in his eyes, the Dutchman shouted out curses and threats to God. Even sailors, known for their skill and profanity, knew that their master crossed the line of decency. Something had to be done. Mutiny. The uprising was not successful. So enraged was the captain that he killed the mutiny leader, throwing the dead man overboard. His drunken ravings called up the attention of the devil, so amused was the Prince of Darkness that when he heard the splash of the former mutineer's body hitting the ocean, he stopped time to visit the captain. The clouds parted and the storm ceased to be. 
Who is this mortal who panders death as if cheaply? The devil stated, disguised as a shadowy creature near the ship's main mast. The Dutchman replied with a line of curse words that made the devil proud. Before Satan knew it, a musket was pointing him in the face. A man was challenging the devil. I never asked for your advice, sir. Now, off my ship with the body, and let us continue onward. As you wish, sir, the devil started to leave. Satan turned, pointing a stern finger at the captain. For your actions and disrespect for my curiosity, you will be condemned to sail these waters. You will command a ghostly crew of corpses, bringing death to all who witness your sails. The devil was heard to laugh, for how long the legend does not say. You shall never make port, nor shall you ever find peace. The storm resumed where it left off, and the ship continued onward. The Dutchman saw the errors of his way, pleading to the devil for a rescue. Gall shall be your drink, and red-hot iron your meat, was the last of Satan's words. From that fatal moment on, the Flying Dutchman was doomed to pilot his ill-fated ship throughout the spectral waters, never resting and never finding a home or safe harbor. His crew, so it is assumed, left with the passengers when they could. On no sighting of the vessel has there ever been crew members or captives who begged to disembark. Sailors have spotted half-dead creatures crewing the ship station, their skeletal faces grinning into the darkness. It is also claimed that sightings of the ship has caused other ship's food supplies to go bad, covering with mold and drying out almost instantly. Water supplies have either dried out, salted over, or turned sour. On some occasions, the Dutchman has come alongside other ships to perform a simple act, deliver mail. If an unlucky sailor or ship receives a delivery from the ghost ship, it brings disaster. If a sailor opens his letter, he dies or is found dead before dawn. If another captain refuses to dock with the Dutchman, that ship will flounder. Eyewitnesses claim to have spotted the Dutchman at the wheel of his vessel, crying up to the heavens. His bare head was covered with regret and the long labor of repentance. He was hoping and praying for someone of divinity not only to take note, but to grant him peace. It seems that although God may forgive, the devil never forgets. This is the legend and fate of the Flying Dutchman. This story has been told and revamped throughout the centuries, written as a ghost story and sung as an opera. Many notable and believable sightings of the Phantom Ship have been recorded. Every time modern society thinks they have advanced beyond the needs for ocean-based superstitions, the Dutchman makes his presence known. During the Second World War, a crew of German U-boat officers was captured in the mid-Atlantic by an American Liberty ship heading for Great Britain. The submarine inadvertently hit an Allied mine, and their ship perished. Only seven of the crew survived, finding their way into a small lifeboat. All claimed to have spent some time on board an old sailing ship. The captain of the U-boat was babbling, stating to his confused American rescuers, the dead live. The crew disappeared into the bureaucratic paperwork of a world war. Presumably, they were all taken to a local British mental ward and treated. In 1836, a British war vessel almost collided with the Dutchman, but the ship vanished into a fog at the last minute. After the encounter, the first officer of the ship committed suicide. There was left behind no letter of explanation or farewell to family. Officers on board were shocked because they all knew the religious belief of their fallen comrade and understood him to be the kind of man who would never commit God's one unforgivable sin. What could drive a person to take their life? On July 11, 
1881, the HMS Bacanti was rounding the tip of Africa, and a midshipman on watch spotted the spectral vessel heading his way. The sailor signaled to the approaching ship, then, without warning, as if trying to avoid the bachinet, the ancient wreck vanished. The midshipman wrote these words in the log. I insist that this encounter is dutifully recorded in our records. State that we all saw her with her own eyes. The ghost ship is known as the Flying Dutchman. This midshipman was a man of good character and a royal prince who would later become King George V. Although no harm came to the future King of Britain, the lookout who informed the prince about the advancing ghost ship fell from his post and died. The last recorded sighting of the famous ghost ship took place in May of 1942 off the coast of Cape Town. Four witnesses, including a government-employed lawyer, saw the Dutchman sail into the middle of Table Bay, drop her anchor, and vanish. Most folklore scholars have stated that the tale of the Flying Dutchman was based on an actual event of a famous shipwreck and that the reality of the legend should be taken with a huge grain of salt. They state that even the captain's name is wrong. Van der Decken, Van Damien, Van Stratton, or Van Some and Such. There is even a story about a Dutch captain sailing around the Cape of Good Hope in 1641, working out a, a private business agreement with the East India Company. He planned to retire take his family to India, and live a life of luxury. His retirement, of course, never happened. His wife left him for another man, and the captain was heartbroken. He failed to keep track of the ship's course and ran into a dark storm in his misery. The ship sank with the commander still at the wheel. Those who survived were heard saying the captain was a brave soul he was. He stayed at his post as if defying the will of God. He said to the wind that he would make it around the horn and settle his life even if he had to sail his ship until doomsday. Has the Dutchman finally found peace? Since the sighting in 1942, there have been no other. In that episode, the only time the vessel was spotted near a harbor or to lower her anchor, could the unfortunate navigator have finally gained the forgiveness for which he searched? Legends and ghost stories serve a purpose. Some teach, some entertain. Others, like the Dutchman, warn, whatever you do in life, don't mock the devil. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much and until next time, bye!